So we're going back to Haggai. So if you want to turn your Bible or open up your app to that, we are going to continue on into, into the words of Haggai the prophet. And this is a wonderful passage of Scripture that's going to challenge us to grow in the Lord. And, and I am going to get very specific with some things that I think that the Lord has led me to before we're done. And, and um, Haggai had a very interesting ministry. Each one of his messages built upon the one before. And so let's read the passage, and then we'll, we'll get into the message. So we're going to start in verse 10. And it says, On the twenty-fourth day of the ninth month, in the second year of Darius, the word of the Lord came by Haggai the prophet. Thus says the Lord, Ask the priests about the Lord. If anyone carries holy meat in the fold of his garment and touches with his fold bread or stew or wine or oil, or any kind of food, does it become holy? The priest answered and said, No. Then Haggai said, If anyone who is unclean by contact with a dead body touches any of these, does it become unclean? And the priest answered and said, It does become unclean. And then Haggai answered and said, So it is with this people and with this nation before me, declares the Lord, and so with every work of their hands. And what they offer there is unclean. Now then, consider from this day forward. Before stone was placed upon the stone of the temple, how did you fare? When one came to a heap of twenty measures, there were but ten. When one came to the wine vat to draw fifty measures, there were but twenty. I struck you all and all the products of your toil with blight and with mildew and with hail, yet you did not turn to me, declares the Lord. Consider from this day onward, from the twenty-fourth day of the month, and from the 24th day of the ninth month, since the day that the foundation of the Lord's temple was laid, consider, is the seed yet in the barn? Indeed, the vine and the fig tree and the pomegranate and the olive oil have yielded nothing. But from this day on, I will bless you. Say that again. I will bless you. Watch this video. What? What keeps you, what keeps us from following God? Maybe it's the way we, we procrastinate the things that we just know are truth. We procrastinate good versus evil. We procrastinate right versus wrong. Hey, hey, Dad. Yeah. Uh, those are not my cigarettes. These are not your cigarettes? <laughs> nah, but you can put them in here. <laughs> All right. That didn't really work out like a plan. <laughs> yeah. What's hey, listen, uh, my buddies are uh -huh. going to see this movie, uh -huh. okay? And I know you and I know about the movie. We've talked about it, uh -huh. okay? But before you say anything, uh -huh. before you say anything, okay? Uh -huh. I know, okay? I know that there is some cussing in the movie, uh -huh. okay? But it's just a little bit, okay? Just a little bit, and I know it's not real, uh -huh. okay? And um, there's some violence, okay? Mm -hmm. But it's just a little bit, just a little bit, and I know it's not real, you right. know? Yeah. And there's some nudity in it, okay? Uh, but it's just a little, it's just a little, and I know it's not real. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, can I please go see the movie, please? Please, 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 please. Okay. I, I knew it. You don't ever let me do anything. I don't, what do you say? You can go see the movie. That's awesome. You're the coolest guy in the whole wide world. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Before you go, I knew we were going to have this conversation again, so um, I decided I would make you some of my famous brownies that you loved since you were a kid. These are, these are my favorite brownies You've in the whole wide world. You've loved those brownies since you were I a love little these. kid. And so I thought I'd just make them for you. You know, I, same great ingredients that I always put in those brownies, yeah. but this time I just added a little bit of something, just a little bit of something. It shouldn't affect the whole batch. It's just a little bit of something. You shouldn't mess with perfection. That's, that's my point exactly. That's my point exactly. Yeah. But I've added the same ingredients that I always have. You've got the eggs, the flour, the cocoa. You've got the little bit of vanilla. You've got the almonds. Same great ingredients that I always put in Powdered there. Powdered sugar. Powdered sugar is in there. But this time I added just a little bit of something. Brown sugar. Brown sugar. A little bit of brown sugar, yeah. White sugar. Uh, uh, sure, sure. Yeah, we'll go with that, Ed Lib. Sure. See, but um, see, but I added just a little bit of something in there. Just a little bit of something. It shouldn't affect the whole batch, though. Cumin? No. All spice? No. Old spice? No. I can taste a little different. Just but, a, but it shouldn't affect the whole batch, son. It's just a little bit. I mean, yes, same wonderful ingredients, but it's just a little bit of something. What is it? Dog poop. <laughs> Excuse so, me? Just a little bit, son. It's just a little bit. <laughs> it is dog poop. <laughs> From the big dog or the little dog? 
from the little dog poop. That's a load off. Why would you put dog poop in the brownie? Son, it shouldn't affect the whole batch. It's just a little bit. It's just a little bit. I get it. What? It's just a little bit. It's just a little bit. What? Hey, the next time you don't want me to go see a movie, just say, Son, don't go see a movie. Don't feed me poop brownies. <laughs> I don't even want to go to the movie now. I just want to go get something to drink. That better be lemonade in the refrigerator. So let's think about, in the context of what Haggai's preaching, draw out some literal application for them, and then see how that applies to us. So the Lord's first question there in verse 10, if a, whole, if a person is carrying a holy offering and brushes up against something, so the meat that's been sacrificed to the Lord is holy, and he's carrying it, the priest brushes up against something that's unholy, does that unholy object then become holy? No. Holiness is not transferred that way. However, the second question is, is very important for us to understand. He says, if a person is defiled by contact with a dead body, does that person then make everything he comes in contact with unholy? And the answer is yes. And in the immediate context of what Haggai's preaching and telling them here is that they're offering to the Lord whether that be money or time or anything else, is unholy because they are unholy. And that just giving it to the Lord does not make them holy. Just giving it to the Lord, in, in a sense, doesn't even make the offering holy. Because it was given with unholy hands. So we, we need to make sure that we don't miss the meaning of this passage. So many times we usually put holiness in some of the context of things that we don't do, in some kind of hierarchy of sin, that adultery is bad, theft is bad, abusing your kids is, or your spouse is wrong, drugs are bad and wrong. And there's nothing wrong with, with saying that. No one's going to deny that those things are wrong. But as far as those things go, I don't think that any person watching this, and if you are, you can be saved today. You can be delivered. But as a rule, people sitting in church are not doing any of those things. But those pass this passage is not about those things directly. Okay? It, it, the bigger issue is quite simple. The people were not single in their devotion to God, so everything that they gave, God did not accept it first off, but then second, it, he goes on to say, I'm the one that gave the mildew, the blight, and the hail. And I get ahead of myself, but don't miss this. That this is the revelation of the two passages before this. That we talked about how that we're in similar circumstances to the children of Israel. That we don't care about the house of the Lord. We don't come ready to worship. We don't come ready to build up our fellow believers. We come wanting to be entertained. We come wanting to see what, the, what, what can be done for me. What can change my happiness? What can change my attitude? They better do it the way I think it should be done. We come expecting it to be the way I want it. And God's not really in control of the service. We are. We demand a certain flair to the services. We demand that certain things happen, or if they don't, God was not in that service. Really? We say things like that, that we believe that, the, the, that God is in the middle of the service and that he gives gifts and people as he wills, but then when it doesn't work out the way we think it should, a certain gift doesn't manifest itself, or the preacher doesn't do a certain thing, all of a sudden now, whoa, God wasn't there. The worship team doesn't do it just, just right, or they miss that transition, or that song they were off beat, or the music was too loud, or all those things that go into that, or the congregation, that kid that sits behind me just drives me nuts. Or that they weren't spiritual enough so that the Holy Spirit wasn't able to move. Really? That's all about us. That's not about us worshiping God and Him doing as He sees fit. Then we talked about 
Whether we have, last, a couple weeks ago, we talked about whether we have a, a loss for prodigals and the lost. We're so consumed with politics and economics and social problems that the church is let down on the one thing it's supposed to be doing, sharing the love of Christ. Whether that be sharing the love of Christ in the sense that they're broken and downhearted and they need help, a, me a mental, emotional, physical help, whether that means that they, they become saved and they come in, I think that it is so instructive to us as the church that the ten lepers that came, Jesus healed all ten of them, eight went their way, but two came and worshipped. Jesus, when the two came and worshipped, he did not say, where are the other eight? Their leprosy is back. No, he let them walk in the blessing of being healed. The church, <laughs> Unless all 10 of them comes, it's a failure. Unless we can guarantee that all 10 of them are going to become members of the church. Oh, no. The love of Christ should compel us to give with no idea of return. We talked about that the, that the prodigals are out there. People that were out that are, should be in church that are not. We've talked about the lost that there are hundreds of people just here within close to us. You know people, if you're watching this online, that, that, know, that do not know the Lord. What are you doing about that? How many people did you invite to church last year? How many people did you mentor to grow in the faith? Yeah, but the lockdown happened. Really? Again, you did Facebook, you did Zoom, you did Skype, you did all half a dozen other things that you could have used to encourage the faith. And some of you started good, and then it fell apart. You didn't take the time to encourage others. You didn't take the time to talk to someone about Jesus. Which brings us to the passage. First, I want to encourage you and, and commend you as a congregation, Gospel Lighthouse. You did well through the shutdown and then in coming back. You, the offerings did not slack like I've heard about at some churches. You come and you stayed with the services, whether they were on first Facebook and when we came back to the physical building. Those of you that have been watching on Facebook, you've continued to watch. You, sh you should be commended for that. But hear the words of the prophet. I implore you to hear the words of the prophet. Because you did not have a heart for the lost, or you've got caught up in comparing yourself to other services or demanding that they be just how you want them, you are not being blessed of God. You're not being blessed as individuals, and you're not being blessed as a congregation. Notice in verse 17, Notice in verse 17, he says, I struck you and all the products of your toil with blight and with mildew and with hail. As a rule, in this context at least, blight is drought, mildew is too much water, hail is just outright destruction. Who did that? The Lord did it. Not the enemy, not society. If the Lord be for us, who can be against us? But the flip side of that is if the Lord be against us, who can be for us? Both mildew and blight, it may take time for them to, you may plant and start to see it grow, and then it dies. Mildew is, is, is sometimes rots from the inside out. Sometimes you can just see outright destruction, with, especially with hail. But the point is, is that the Lord is the one who's done that. Why? Because our eyes have not been single towards the Lord. And notice in verse 15, he uses the word consider. Notice in verse 18, the word considers there twice. What are we supposed to be considering? We're supposed to be considering this idea right here. Is my eye, if my heart, is the purpose of my life, is the, the, the thoughts of my mind singularly focused on the Lord? Or are they focused on 
the problems in the building? Are they focused on the problems in the board? Are they focused on the problems of this or the problems of that? Is it all about me? Or is it about what God is doing? Is it all about, well, I'll talk about Jesus when the services are a certain way, or I'll talk about the Jesus and invite people to church when the building is a certain way, or when the preaching is just how I like it, that's when I'll start talking about the Lord. Hear the words of the prophet. <laughs> Consider your ways. Consider that I'm the one that brought the hail, the mildew, and the blight. Every one of us can pick apart every church. Every one of us can find things that we don't like about the preaching, the worship, the leadership. <laughs> but if your eye is single on God, it's not that you ignore those things. You pray about them and you do your part to, to fix them. But if they're still not to your liking... Your eye is on the Lord, and you're focused on the Lord, and you're pushing forward towards the Lord. And if your eye is single on the Lord, you're, you're full with the grace and the glory of the living God. You want others to have that. And he says that, that the real sin in the church is the complaining, the critical nature. We wonder why our time's not being blessed. We wonder why our money's not being blessed. How can God bless it? Let us repent and really seek God. He's not hindered by anything. God uses all sorts of styles of preaching. Worship. God uses good preaching. He uses, I mean, good, good worship. He uses what we would call bad worship. He uses one instrument. He uses a multitude of instruments. God is not hindered by what we want, what we think he's hindered by. God is waiting for you to invite people to church. God uses cups of coffee. He uses gentle words. He uses the shining love of someone's life for Christ and for others. The little bit of your unbelief, the little bit of your complaining, the little bit of your refusal to, to pray or talk about the Lord to the lost or to that prodigal that's in your life is keeping God from blessing you as an individual and blessing us as a church. The Israelites repented and started to do the work of God. And even before the vine had matured, even before the fig tree had finished blossoming, even before the grain had been harvested, God told them that I'm going to fulfill my work in you from this day forward. If you've ever planted something, you know that there is a, a time of, of growth. There's a time of maturity. There's a time when the fruit first sets, but then it's got to mature. And, and God is saying, no more blight. No more mildew. No more hail. They'd gotten in such a habit of, of, of that when they would start to, to do something, they would plant. Oh, today is going to be a bad storm. That's going to die. Oh, today is going to be bad. This is going to this is going to die. We're not going to see the fruitfulness of our fight. God say, no, 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 no. Hang on, hang on, hang on. That's all over. From this day forward, as you've repented, as you work with me, I'm going to bless you. I'm going to go with you. Things are going to be different from this point forward. Gospel Lighthouse, whatever that looks like in your life, and I and I don't want to get real specific beyond what I have. But I want to challenge you to start to pray differently. I want to challenge you with seeing the services differently. I want to challenge you with giving differently. It's not a question that you are praying or not praying. I, I believe that you are praying. It's not a question of you that, that, you're, that you're giving or not giving. I, I think you're giving. I've seen the numbers. I know you're giving. This passage is about a condition of the heart. In fact, the whole book of Haggai, he's stirring them up, not just the physical things they were doing, but what are their attitudes? Let's pray. Father, we just come before you and we give you thanks for your goodness and your mercy. I pray, Lord God, 
that you would give us singleness of heart, singleness of mind. That you would challenge us to quit seeing this as good or seeing that as good. There's only one good, and that is you. We've complained about this, or we've whined about that so much, or we've, we've expected so much out of a worship team or a certain style of preaching or a, a certain type of building. And Lord, I pray that you would help us to lay all that down. That all of those things are keeping us from having our eyes single towards you. Lord, we just give you the praise, the honor, and the glory for all of those things. For the work that you're doing within us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.